And um, I want to would like to uh, first of all um, introduce myself, Charlie Foskett, chair of the finance committee. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are perfect and can hear me. I will be reciting the mandated uh, protocol with respect to remote meetings. Uh, please uh, indicate. This meeting is being recorded. Your presence, uh, Grant Gibbon. I'm here. Shane Blundell. Here. John Ellis. Carolyn White. Mary Margaret Franklemont. Yes, I'm here. Uh, Arif Padaria. Arif here. Here. Sorry. Jonathan yeah. Wallet. Here. I'm here. Brian Beck. Here. Peter Howard. Peter. Shailene Pokris. I'm here. Yeah. Daryl Harmer. Here. John Dice. Here. Alan Jones. Here. Andy LaCourt. Here. Uh, Bill Keller. Alan Tosti. Here. George Koser. Here. Christine Deschler. Here. Dean Carmen. Here. David McKenna. Here. Thank you. John Ellis is here. John Ellis is here. Okay. So um, <clears throat> let me uh, uh, to the open meeting of the Arlington Finance Committee. Uh, some people must have their microphone on. If you can mute yourselves, it would be helpful for everyone, I think. Um, this is uh, an open meeting consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID virus, we've been advised and directed to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in publicly accessible physical location. To further, all members of the public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment only in writing by email to ediggins at town.arlington.ma.us.com, not ma.us. Uh, for this meeting, the Finance Committee is convening by a uh, video conference on the Zoom app that's posted on the town's website, which also identifies how the public may join and comment. Um, this meeting is being recorded, so uh, please uh, be aware that you should keep your uh, computers and screens uh, confidential if you have confidential information there. Uh, anything that you broadcast might be recaptured by the recording. All the supporting materials that have been provided to members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is uh, encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair notes otherwise. Um, the chair will introduce each speaker on the agenda and after they include their remarks, the chair will get down the line and miss the list of members and checking to see if anyone wants to make comments and will hold all votes by roll call. So um, I would like to, uh, uh, Liz, I didn't call your name. Uh, Liz, Liz Diggins, you're here? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we are anticipating, uh, I believe we're anticipating two guests tonight, uh, Dr. Boquillen and Dr. Girardi from um, Minuteman uh, Vocational Technical School uh, in a short period of time, shortly. I'm here, Mr. Chairman. Ah. Dr. Boquillen, are you uh, uh, are you alone? Lost your video or audio? Oh, I'm sorry. Let me try this. What's happening here? Am I muted? I can hear you, Charlie. Yeah, I I, I was asking uh, uh, Dr. Boquillen if you are the sole representative, or is there anyone else with you from Minuteman? Um, it appears to be me, sir. We're delighted that you're here. Thank you. I am too. Okay, the uh, first order of um, the first order of business. Um, I would like to uh, 
note that uh, we please get your but your budgets uh, completed and in as quickly as possible. Uh, please note in the calendar when you're ready to present them. And secondly, um, it, let me know tonight uh, when we get to old business or um, by email to, to myself and Liz, if you have any comments on the uh, the warrant documents that I sent out after we did the warrant review last week. Um, so please feel free to, to note that if, if we missed anything or if something else should be added, uh, because we'll be following that document in future meetings. Uh, the next item on the agenda are the minutes of February 22nd for approval. Peter Howard. Peter. You're on mute, Peter. Sorry about that. There have been several uh, <clears throat> corrections uh, that people have made. I thank them very much and I, they're incorporated. I move a, the minutes be approved as corrected. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, David. So the minutes have been moved and seconded. Any further comments on the minutes? Um, Grant Gibbion? Aye. Dean Blundell? Aye. John Ellis? Aye. Carolyn White. Mary Margaret Franklin? Aye. Arif Badaria? Aye. Jonathan Wallach? Aye. Brian Beck? Aye. Peter Howard? Yes. Shailene Pokris? Daryl Harmer? Aye. John Deist? Aye. Alan Jones. Aye. Mm -hmm. Annie LaCourt. Aye. Bill Keller. Aye. Uh, Peter, would you note that Bill Keller is here? Aye. I just did. Thank you. Uh, Alan Tassi. Aye. George Koser. Aye. Christine Deschler. Yes. Adine Corman. Yes. And David McKenna. Yes. Thank you. So the next item uh, on the agenda uh, is uh, the Minuteman uh, budget. Andy, I'd right. like to make a few comments. I'm sorry, Peter, did you? Excuse me. So they passed, right, unanimously? Yes, sorry. I swallowed my words on that one. No problem. Um, uh, yeah, I'd just like to say a couple of things. Um, uh, 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 Dr. Boquillan and I met this morning to review his presentation and where things are at with the budget. It's always, it's a pleasure uh, working with Dr. Boquillan. And um, I believe that um, you will get the complete picture of where things are at with Minuteman um, at the moment and that the news is all pretty good, uh, except with the exception of course of, you know, the effects of COVID which are affecting everybody and um, uh, depressing. I'd also like to note that Michael Ruderman who is the, um, uh, our school committee rep is also on the call um, and may want to at least say hello. Um, so I think um, with that, we're uh, ready to proceed. Thank you, Annie. Uh, hello, Michael. Welcome to the meeting. Dr. Boquillan. Yes, I am able to share. So I'm assuming you can see that okay? Just shaking your head, yes. Yes, we can. And I'm going to suggest to the committee that we let you go uh, completely through your presentation and then we will, uh, if, if you can, uh, take questions. Oh, absolutely. I appreciate it. Um, it's good to see you even in little screens. Um, hope everyone's doing well. So our preliminary budget we've entitled this year, Preparing for Reality. And to get right to it, our overall operating budget is up a, a modest 2.4%. Our operating and capital debt is up about 450,000 and I'll explain where that is. The major increase in the assessment is due of course to the uh, MSBA building project debt, which peaks in FY22, gets a little slightly higher in FY23 and then levels out and starts to go down. But we're hitting the peak of the debt service. Um, are some assumptions we've made in revenue um, you can see our estimated aid from the state, um, Chapter 74, uh, excuse me, Chapter 78 is down. That's really a function of uh, Belmont not being in the district any longer, and their minimum local contribution is no longer noted in this line item. Uh, regional transportation aid is down too because uh, March, when we were all 
uh, went to a fully remote model, uh, we no longer needed the buses and our contract with the bus company was such that we didn't have to pay. So the reimbursement for next year is based upon last year's expenses, which were lower. So that's lower as well. <clears throat> and now we get into our, uh, our revenue from out of district students, uh, tuition that we're collecting this year. And this revenue um, assumption is called prior year tuition. Then we have current year tuition, um, current year capital fee and prior year capital fee. So we've tried to make up our assumptions of revenue deficits with the tuition that we're collecting. And as that tuition revenue is probably going to go down over the next few years as our enrollment increases from member towns, there was an intentional uh, discussion around utilizing it to keep assessments low. Some of the assumptions in the budget, we feel that some COVID is gonna be with us. Um, there'll be some form of hybrid learning and remote learning. Certainly safety and health measures are gonna continue. We don't know whether, um, as I mentioned, the state aid is gonna go up or down. I know there's good word coming from the federal government about a, uh, another stimulus package, but we tend not to count on things until the check clears and it's in our account. Um, as I mentioned, the final bonding for the MSBA project will be in this fiscal year. And student enrollment has grown beyond the capacity, the size of the school. Um, I'll help talk more about that later, but we're looking at how do we increase the capacity of the school? Uh, it was designed for 628 students. We currently have 630. Next year, we're anticipating close to 680, perhaps more. And just to focus in on admissions and enrollment for a moment, you can see by this slide, in the far right column is uh, the current eighth graders who are applying to Minuteman. And this is as of this week, there is still a little bit more time left in the admissions enrollment cycle, but we have a total of 351 applicants, 261 are from our nine member towns. Um, out of district applications from eligible towns, an eligible town is considered a town that has no vocational education available to those students. We have about 48, uh, 42 applicants from non-eligible towns. We still get applicants from Boston, Somerville, Cambridge, Waltham. Um, and so we have a wait list. Uh, this past week, we sent out offers of enrollment to 201 students, which is about the max, it is the maximum size we can have for a freshman class. Um, and there are 40 in-district students currently on a waiting list, and all of the out-of-district students are on a waiting list. So uh, that's not happiness for me. Um, I want to be able to serve all our member towns, and uh, the size of the school uh, simply won't allow it at this point. So we're, as I mentioned, uh, the budget priorities, protecting health and safety, looking at how can we increase our enrollment capacity in the school that we have. If you look at the vocational shop sizes, we could easily accommodate 200 freshmen a year and 800 total enrollment. What we're limited by is <clears throat> classroom space. We're also starting our animal science vet assisting program this year. Uh, we'll be accepting only freshmen. They will operate out of a lab, a science lab. And then we have a building on campus that we're looking to uh, use our students, our trade students to renovate into a an animal science clinic, if you will, uh, partnering with Blue Pearl and some other employers in the area. We're also expanding our logistics engineering program through a grant we received recently, $300,000 from the Capital Skills Grant Fund. We have space in the building for that. Um, and our other budget priorities are our athletic fields getting uh, finished this summer. And that hopefully in a COVID free environment or a COVID met modified environment, we'll be able to ramp up our facilities rental and revenues because we've had none uh, for more than a year. The big drivers in the FY22 operating budget, um, we're in year two of a three year contract with our teachers. The cost of living increase in the upcoming year is 2.25%. In FY23, uh, it calls for a 2% increase. We've had increased electrical and utility costs. Um, 
I think it's a function of COVID, partly because we've had fewer people in the building generating BTUs, and we've had to increase the air exchanges in accord with the recommendations from CDC, Department of Health, et cetera. We also are uh, implementing maintenance contracts on the new systems that are in the building that have come online. Uh, our property insurance has gone up because the value of this building is a little more than the, the value of the old building. And believe it or not, our health insurance is going down, but that's really a function of fewer staff in the building who uh, had been laid off as a result of COVID in March, mostly paraprofessionals and support staff, and we will not be bringing them back in in FY22. Our transportation budget is down, uh, mainly because we had, believe it or not, a competitive bidding process for our transportation contract, which was uh, rebid last year and the amount came in less than what we had budgeted for. So the full assessment counting all the debt is, for Arlington is 6.8 million. That's an increase of almost $700,000 over fiscal year FY21. <clears throat> and if we look at the components of the assessment, um, the minimum local contributions about 2.4, transportation, the operating assessment 2.1, then the debt and capital that's in the operating budget, and that's the ESCO uh, lease that we're still paying, as well as a contribution to our capital stabilization fund. And you can see the largest hunk of this increase is in the building project debt service, which in Arlington, you voted to exclude that. So I think Adam might have uh, swallowed his tea when he got our assessment estimate. But here's another reason um, the, uh, the assessments are going up in Arlington. We're up to about 170 Arlington students currently. And those of you that were involved, especially uh, Charlie and Al, um, when we were redoing the regional agreement, we put in a four year rolling average. And this is certainly moderating the increases uh, that we're experiencing really in most communities, but it's, essentially, especially in Arlington. We currently have close to 100 applicants from Arlington for next year's freshman class. Uh, unfortunately, not all of them are going to get in and I can explain that a little bit more in detail if there's a question, but um, a tremendous amount of interest from our member communities. Special ed enrollment has been about the same percentage wise, about 46 to 49%. Um, and that's a large part of our budget, as you know. According to the Department of Ed and FY19, it was about 12.4% of our overall budget, which is the highest level of special ed expenditure compared to other vocational schools in the area. Capital budget, just to break it out a little bit, the athletic fields, ESCO, um, is up about $179,000. That's the payment on the athletic fields lighting. Just a reminder, we were able to save over 4.2 million, I think, from the uh, MSBA project to put towards the fields. In addition to that, we had 1.2 million from our capital stabilization fund that we put towards that. And we also bid out the alternates of lighting and, and for this additional payment, we are able to borrow a little bit more to get lighting, which of course, expands the hours available for rental revenues. Um, the school building project, we're gonna go going out for our final borrowing. And then the uh, capital stabilization fund, we're continuing to fund. Just a reminder about that capital stabilization fund, we, the school committee established it, I think in FY15, because we had anticipated that the FF&E, the furnitures, fixtures and equipment formula through the MSBA was going to be woefully inadequate for a high quality vocational technical school. So we started to set aside money. What we didn't anticipate, fortunately, we were very successful in getting capital skills grants. With this latest 300,000, we got over 1.5 million in equipment grants, um, which was quite a, uh, we're grateful for that. So that capital stabilization, we're still going to keep it going, still going to fund it uh, so that we maintain these facilities in the high, you know, as they are now 
and not let them get away from us. <clears throat> uh, the Athletic Fields Project, uh, the, the bid was awarded and approved back in January. Obviously not much has gone on with the weather we've had, but we anticipate um, completion by the early fall. And we are setting aside another 168,000 a year, hopefully through our revolving accounts that we're generating revenue from these fields. So that in 10, 12 years time, when we have to replace these fields, we don't have to go back and assess the towns for that. We also were very pleased that finally we got our photovoltaic contract signed. You may recall we had some risk involved with this because the company we'd been working with pulled out at the last minute. So we had to go out to bid again, find another company. And the reason this is important is that it ensures because of our LEED certification that we will receive $2 million in reimbursement from the state. Um, we had always planned on that 2 million and this now this guarantees it for us. Um, and also we're going to be saving 25 to 35,000 a year in uh, electrical uh, utility costs. It's a roof mounted system versus a, a canopy system, which we had previously thought was going to happen. Um, so we're, we're happy this is actually getting done now. OPEB, um, our OPEB liability estimated around 32 million. We've been contributing a small amount, 50,000 a year for a few years. We're gonna increase that marginally to 60,000 um, this year and next year. The long-term discussion at the FinCom has been when the ESCO comes off the books that we'd utilize that amount of money or nearly all of it, depending on the situation as we look at retiring that debt in FY25 and we put that amount of money towards our, uh, into our OPEB trust fund, a reserve fund. This just gives you an overview of what our reserve fund activity, we have had no real rental revenues. Um, we currently have 350,000 in the OPEB trust. Um, so that's that. So the overall budget, putting everything together is up substantially, I think 8.4%. Again, most of that is from the debt service. Um, operating budget up, I think a reasonable 2.4%. Arlington's assessment is six point, almost 6.8 million. That concludes my overview, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. McQuillan. Um, so, um, do you have, if anybody has any questions for uh, Dr. McQuillan or for Mr. Ruderman or for Annie, uh, please uh, raise your hand. Ah, Peter Howard. <clears throat> Peter, did you raise your hand? Sorry. Um, uh, Dr. McClellan, what's the ESCL stand for? ESCO? Yes. Uh, I think it's energy service contract. We did a tax exempt municipal leaf, lease about 12 years ago to do some really health and safety energy upgrades into the old building, replacing the electrical switch gear, um, doing some uh, modest amount of weatherization and replacing the uh, oil fired boilers, which had pretty much run their useful life away. Mr. Foskett correctly uh, characterized that as a lost asset a few years ago, which is a term I use frequently. And I, uh, I cite Mr. Foskett for that. George Koser, thank, thank you, Ed. I just, I would like to ask a question that you raised in your presentation earlier about if a set of Arlington students who applied are not admitted um, what your criteria are, or what your process is for, uh, sure. for dealing with that situation? Well, any, any uh, chapter 74 approved uh, school district that has five or more programs must have an admissions policy. And our admissions policy 
has pretty much been the same. And we have five criteria that all students who are applying to Minuteman are subject to. All five are balanced equally. That's grades, attendance, discipline, uh, personal interview with every student and a recommendation from an adult, um, usually from the school that they're applying from. Now, uh, what we've had to do as we've experienced greater interest than we have room for is we've had to invoke that piece of the admissions policy, which talks about a slot allocation formula. So that slot allocation formula is primarily based upon the share that each town has in the operating expenditures of the district. So this coming year, the slot allocation for Arlington, uh, the slots are, be I think 75 or so slots are available. And if not other towns, if some other towns don't use their slots, then that would go to the next student on the list. Uh, but we've sent out, uh, I think 70, 75 uh, enrollment offers to Arlington students uh, about a week ago. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, George, is that, do you have any other questions? I have one other uh, quick question, which is, do the, are the field revenues expected to cover the $168,000 set aside for replacing the turf as well, or is that a separate item in the budget? Our expectation, uh, and we had uh, a study done, <clears throat> and we had our own study reviewed by an independent uh, consultant, uh, agreed that our once all fields are up online and COVID is not a factor, those fields would conservatively generate between three hundred and four hundred thousand dollars a year. So that would offset some of the operational costs and allow us to set aside. Uh, and I think the uh, the mechanism is that some of the revolving funds would be uh, deposited into the capital stabilization fund. So the answer is yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, Arif Padaria. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, quick question for you, sir, is um, which of these uh, curricula are the most popular the mm -hmm. academic programs or the career and technical education, where do you find uh, the maximum enrollment? That's part one of my question. And the second one is the new areas, these new academic programs that you've created and you're enrolling for, um, how did you come about selecting those? And where did you, how did you analyze the need for those? And That's a great question. Thank you. So our most popular programs right now, I, I'm just going from memory. I can get the specific numbers for you later, but generally speaking, this past year anyway, um, web and programming design, um, health assisting, electrical trades, environmental technology, um, uh, welding and metal fabrication. I'm sort of giving you in the top order down. Um, we're all well, well enrolled. Um, as we're going forward, we're looking at the incoming class and there's a tremendous amount of interest in the animal science program, um, as well as the engineering programs. Uh, we have two new teachers, uh, both from the field of engineering, both ladies who are really uh, creating a lot of excitement and buzz among the students um, that are selecting their programs. So the way that we come about selecting programs is Part of it is prescribed by Chapter 74 law or regulations of the Department of Education, where you look at three factors. You look at job growth, um, living wage, and student interest. At Minuteman, we look at six factors. So in addition to those three, we also look at, do we have a strategic partner, uh, an employer, sometimes a post-secondary institution, in that particular field. The fifth uh, indicator that we look at is, um, is there some emerging technology coming from that occupational area that has uh, an impact in our region uh, where students who are graduating from these things are going on to college in these 
would have a reasonable chance of coming back to the state and working. And the sixth indicator that we use is, are there other training programs like this in the region? In other words, we don't want to oversupply the training uh, in excess of the demand. So we look at labor market data. Uh, we also have over 200 employers on our advisory committees. And those advisory committees meet a couple times a year and give us direction uh, about where things are trending in terms of occupational opportunity. Um, so. so thank you. If I may ask a follow-up question, um, manufacturing certainly a huge momentum of manufacturing coming back to America as we've mm -hmm. seen supply chains just get disrupted with COVID <clears throat> and the continuation of that. Um, how is advanced manufacturing and specifically perhaps uh, new techniques and new mechanisms, not so new, but certainly getting more mainstream like 3D printing. How mm -hmm. has that been incorporated into your curriculum? Oh, fully. Uh, we, we're just adding an additive manufacturing industry recognized credential for the 3D printing components of what we're doing. Uh, all of our advanced manufacturing equipment is four years old or newer. Um, and, we've, and, and if you've ever been to the school, which not many people have since COVID, but um, you'll see how we've designed the school so that metal fabrication, advanced manufacturing, robotics, automation, engineering are all contiguous to one another and their shops actually have access to one another. And then right across from the robotics lab is something that we call the uh, toil lab, um, mirrored after our partners at Lincoln, uh, MIT Lincoln lab stands for Technology Office Innovation Lab. And across from that is our warehouse, which we just had equipped. So we're teaching traditional warehousing skills, logistics engineering, but we're also adding a uh, sort of an automated pick and pack system over there, uh, utilizing robotics. Um, we're really, we're expanding into industry 4.0 credentialing through Festo Corporation out of Germany. Mm -hmm. um, our, my teachers are just finishing up their training in that. So there'll be about eight different industry recognized credentials that support students moving into the industry 4.0 environments. Um, as a matter of fact, we have some community colleges coming to look at the work that we're doing in this space. Um, and I'm pretty excited that it's finally starting to, to kind of all come together. And, and it's really due in large part to the new staff. Um, they're coming directly from industry. They know what, uh, well, it's hard. To, they know what I'm talking about and I don't know what I'm talking about sometimes. <laughs> no, thanks a lot. That's, uh, that's awesome. And I should just mention, uh, I'm involved in 3D printing, happy to help. And Festo, oh, the owners of Festo are very dear friends of mine, actually. Oh, They're really? Good partners of ours. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you. Oh, I love them. Yeah. They took me love on to a trip. come and see the school. I should actually come down and see the school. Come on down. I'll give you a socially distant tour anytime, and the warnings are good. Thank you, sir. No, seriously. Really. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Arif. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Uh, Tosti had a question. Ellen. Ellis. Ellen? <laughs> yes. Um, actually, I've got three questions. Alan <laughs> Jones. Oh, sorry. Oh, hi. <laughs> Greetings, Dr. McQuillan. Um, yeah, I was going to say you should hit up uh, Arif for some deals on a couple of 3D printers. His company's right up the road from you. It's on the other side of Hanscom, so it, it's a good thing. But um, I was wondering if you could just make some uh, remarks about how you've been dealing with remote learning with some of the hands-on trades. And, uh, and, and beyond that, um, if, if there are aspects of remote learning that are working well for you, would there be a consideration to continue it into the future, maybe as a possible partial solution to the enrollment uh, limitations? It's a fascinating question, actually. Well, let me answer the first part of that. Um, our hybrid model that began in September is really a 25% capacity in-person learning. So we have one grade in Minuteman uh, and they're in their vocational technical training area all day, every day, all week, while the other three grades have been getting remote learning. And one of those other three grades we're getting remote CTE learning, career and technical education learning. Starting on Monday, we're going up to 50% in-person learning. 
So one grade will be in their CTE and the other grade will be going through a, a regular academic day, not a regular day. We've changed the schedule quite a bit um, to kind of deal with that. Um, so we're very fortunate, A, obviously in a brand new building in terms of you know, ventilation and all that stuff. We also were able to provide each teacher with their own uh, teaching space here. So all the remote learning is happening from Minuteman. Uh, we worked with the teachers union and had that all worked out. Um, as we go into this new um, hybrid model with the uh, 50% enrollment, uh, there, there'll probably be a few teachers we'll have to make some additional accommodations for uh, because of conditions and all that such. But we, we purchased, we had a pretty robust IT infrastructure in the new building, as you can imagine. Uh, however, we did purchase with some of the funds that we've, we've received uh, some, I don't know the exact technical term, but they're very uh, high def, high tech uh, cameras that actually follow the teacher around the classroom. So the teacher's not locked in in front of like we are. And we've um, gotten probably about a dozen of those into the shop area. So the CTE teachers who are teaching remotely have actually been experiencing some, uh, when the kids come back for in-person learning, uh, my electrical teacher was just telling me yesterday that the freshmen are doing sophomore work. And he, he attributes it to all the, uh, the uh, related academic work that they've done remotely. And some of the, uh, the modeling, um, uh, what it, VR, virtual reality stuff that we've been able to uh, borrow, <laughs> Some of it we've had to purchase. Um, so there have been some good things about it. Um, whether we're going to, I don't, I can't give you a, a good example of what we might continue, but like any kind of challenge, we're going to pick what has worked, what's improved learning and teaching, and we're going to keep it. Um, but that's a, that's a great question. I think some of the, the teachers have certainly become as a group much more skilled in all kinds of different technologies that might they might not have gotten into without this situation. Um, yeah, I think also, about, I mean, the, the private sector is learning how to do you know more things out of the office, and I think a lot of that's can, yeah. is going to continue. And maybe there are things like web design that could be done that can continue. And again, I'm thinking if that's a potential partial solution to the uh, enrollment limitations you have. Let's hope. Thank you. And a reef, sell these kids on four on four color 3D printing and they'll get addicted to it. So build your market. We got one. Come and see it. Thank you. Uh, we got you a rise spotter yeah. too. John Ellis. <laughs> John Ellis. Yep. Thanks. Sorry. I, I didn't quite understand the answer about um the students that can't go to Minuteman. And it, maybe it's just I don't understand the 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 um, state requirements. The state requires the, the opportunity to apply to a vocational school, but not necessarily requires that a student goes to a vocational school. So well, what happens to those students? Are, are, is Arlington required to send them to a different Votech school? Do they just get mixed into the general population at Arlington High School? Could you just explain those mechanics? They stay at, they stay at Arlington High School. Okay. Yep. There's no requirement that Arlington send them anywhere else. John, does that answer your question? Thanks. Al Tossi. Yes, thank you. Uh, good to see you again, doctor. Good to see you, sir. Okay, I've got three questions. One, the first one deals with revenue and specifically state aid. And you have the chapter 70 aid going down by about $108,000 and you've got the transportation reimbursement going down by about 200,000. But when I go on the Department of Ed and the Department of Revenue websites, they have chapter 70 aid going from 1,977,000 in fiscal 21 to 2,025,000 in fiscal 22, uh, which instead means instead of going down 108,000, it's actually going up by 47,000 because mm. your enrollment actually increased while the state across the uh, uh, school districts across the state have lost 30,000 students. So 
it would make sense that your chapter 70 goes up, not down. And on school transportation reimbursement, uh, the websites have the number uh, going from 659,000 in fiscal 21 to 650,000 or about an $8,600 drop instead of 200,000. When mm -hmm. you sort of add that up, that's about a $350,000 difference. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could explain that, please. Yeah, I'm not sure what date you looked at that. Was that today? Yes. Because we had a, a, a difference of opinion with the Department of Ed around some of the numbers that they had published earlier because they had included Belmont and Belmont is no longer a member of the district. So I can check those numbers out, but, um, and also there's no budget approved yet. So I'm not sure what those numbers the Department of Ed is, is basing their estimates on because um, we used the most conservative numbers that we got back in late uh, November, early December. Well, the, the, these are all based on the governor's budget. Mm -hmm. And Belmont dropped out last June. So that should have made it into these numbers, but- like Yeah, it should have, but it didn't. So we had to correct them initially. Yeah. Well, these are the numbers then, like I said, both DOR and DOE, I, I still call it DOE, uh, you know, have on their websites. Uh, yeah, I'll check though. Thanks for, I'll, I'll check that out. I'll ask Bob about it. <clears throat> Okay. Annie, would you, would you follow up with uh, Dr. Boquillen, please, uh, before we vote on the budget and determine where we are with this difference that Alice pointed out? Um, I will do so. Thank you. Okay, my, my second question deals with the uh, heating utility service, maintenance of grounds, uh, and maintenance of buildings. Mm -hmm. um, all these numbers, the heating is going up 88, 80, 89% utility services are going up 42%. Maintenance of grounds, 11%. I could understand that because the athletic fields are being finished. Um, and maintenance of buildings is going up almost 20%, I guess, related to contracts. Um, I, I thought with a smaller, newer building uh, that these costs would be coming down. Mm. Um, now, you've mentioned a, a couple of reasons that you have fewer bodies in the building uh, to do that and more ventilation from COVID. So I can understand part of that, um, but I was really hoping, so can we hope that next year or, or for the next year that these costs will start coming back down and we could see some savings? With all due respect, I hope so. But I hope is, you know, these are what our bills are. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we're pretty puzzled by it ourselves. Um, we've actually, we don't have a final certificate of occupancy here. We still have Gilbane, our construction management firm. We meet every week. There's been several analyses of our of the original um, uh, engineering uh, formulas about what our energy costs would be, because I fully expected them to be less than what they were in the other building but we're not experiencing that for some reason. Yeah, I mean, the building's got to be half the size and no, no swimming pool to heat. No, no, the, the, the old building was 305,000 square feet. The new building is, is 260,000 square feet. Okay. okay, and my last question um, is more curiosity. What is the chapter 74 tuition these days for Minuteman? Um, I have a slide on that. Um, well, as you know, we don't set the tuition. No, I know that. And the tuition has not been set for next year. Currently, the tuition is 18400 for uh, a non-member district. <clears throat> on top of that, if the student's on an IEP, there'd be an additional next year, $6,100. Uh, the capital fee, if they're coming from a community that has uh, no vocational programs, I believe is around 7,500. And then on top of that, they would have to pay transportation. Okay, that's transportation. And the other, the final is, uh, I'm sort of looking at two towns. Um, Belmont, um, 
Looks like they're sending more students than they have in years. They are. Um, so now do they just get lumped in with non-member towns or do they get special right. consideration as a former member town? <clears throat> I'm very pleased to say in the most charitable way I can, they get no special consideration. Okay. And uh, so have you heard from them since they've dropped out? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now let's let's try to uh, keep it to the uh, to the budget, please. Um, Just curious. Yes uh, and no. And is uh, Watertown used to be a major contributor? Mm. They're not anymore. No, they currently have about sixty students um, in the building. Uh, they had about twenty four or five apply, and and it looks like none of them are going to get in, um, and they're going to be spending. You know, this is the one year we've been hoping for in 15 years where it's cheaper to be a member than not a member. Maybe 30 years. Okay, thank, thank okay. you. Thank Alan, you. anything else? No, thank you. Any other questions? I, I have a couple of questions, uh, Dr. Bocon. Sure. Anybody, anybody else on the committee have questions right now? No, okay. Well, I, 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 I'm sorry? How much cheaper is it to be a member as opposed to a non-member? And well, if you if you look at that's a if you look at uh, I have a slide on that actually. Let me just share it. I'm going to share it. Here is a, can you see that? Yeah. Here is if you're a non-member, what your tuition and fees would be. Uh, this is based on FY21 because we didn't have the, and we still don't have the approval from the Department of Ed on our what our capital fee is. But if you're a non-member, it estimated you'd be paying between thirty-three and thirty-seven thousand dollars a student. Uh -huh. If you looked at the per pupil assessment, which does not include capital. Um, in Arlington, they'd be paying about you'd be paying about twenty seven thousand dollars a student. Good. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Ed. Um, <clears throat> so I had a, a couple of questions. I think you answered the first one. The the building debt has the final building debt has just been issued, but we haven't seen it uh, in the in the budget yet, right? So we, the uh, the debt assessment for the new building is going to be increasing for the next several years. No, we've included our final borrowing in this FY22 budget. It's but what an about estimate. The, the debt service. The debt service is included in there. It will peak again. It will peak in FY22. It'll be about the same in FY23, maybe a little bit more, depending on what we borrow the last few million dollars at, and then it'll start to gradually go down. Okay. I can give you a schedule if you'd like. Uh, yeah, I'll get back to the schedule question in a, in a second. That's a good idea. Um, Arlington, since 2019, uh, the Arlington student population has, and I'm not talking about the average now, I'm talking about the per year data that you had in the mm -hmm. budget book, uh, went from, um, you increased it, it increased by 51 students and the total increase in the number of new students looks to me to be about 118 students. Um, do you have a, an idea of how that's going to carry going forward or what's going to happen in that regard going forward? Well, I anticipate um, I'd have to look at the graduating class numbers from Arlington and what the, the slot availability is for next year, but it'll continue to go up in Arlington and in all of our member towns, I believe next year. This October 1, I think will be probably the highest number of me member town kids we've ever had, but the building's hitting its maximum capacity. So it's, it's going to level out um, over the next two or three fiscal years. Okay. Um, <clears throat> any, any data that you're gathering out, if you could forward that to Andy, I'd appreciate it. That'd be helpful. Um, what, what is the status of your, current staff headcount versus the historical uh, once we come out of COVID, mm -hmm. uh, first part of the question. And second, what's, how, wh how has the student teacher ratio changed versus historical? Well, the student teacher ratio is going up 
slowly, more in uh, line with what other vocational schools are. And other vocational schools are somewhere between 11 and 13, because you remember we carry a full academic staff and a full vocational technical staff. Uh, so our, as I mentioned earlier, when COVID hit, we did have some layoffs, but it was all from paraprofessional staff. We've got about 140 professional staff. Uh, we're, um, we're adding 1.5 next year, which is the new animal science teacher. We had planned for half a person last year, so it's a net 0.5 FTE gain, and then a logistics engineering teacher. All other staffing is staying the same. And we're not rehiring some of the paraprofessionals and support staff. Some of the support staff I'm talking, we had some retirement, a retirement in uh, maintenance and operations, and we're not hiring that position back. Um, so th thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> uh, I just wanted to also ask if do you have an audit report or a comprehensive financial report? Um, the, aud uh, the auditors are, the auditors are fit. They haven't presented uh, FY 20 audit to the school committee yet. I don't believe Michael may know better because Michael Rutterman sits on the fin uh, finance Com committee of Minuteman as well. We haven't no, seen Charlie, the latest. We, we, uh, we have not seen that yet. No, no. So, so could uh, someone copy, uh, maybe Michael, you could copy the finance committee when you get a chance. Any, any court would be helpful. Um, and I just want two comments. One, I think your idea of using the ESCO debt for OPEB is great. That's very similar to what we do in Arlington with uh, one of our retirement programs as it, as it dwindled away, we transferred the funding to uh, OPEB. And uh, secondly, um, I have to say that uh, really, really nice work on your enrollment status. Um, I, I was Thank certainly you. a skeptic for a number of years and you proved me wrong. So <laughs> I'm glad to admit it. It's good work. Uh, I'm recording that, Charlie. <laughs> it's being recorded. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> the last question is, do you, do you have a five-year plan? A five-year capital plan or a no, five-year? You know, a business, uh, just your know, forecast of where you're going with, with expenses and as well as capital. We haven't reviewed it lately. Um, with COVID, we sort of need to review it and see where we are with some of this stuff. We had a five-year plan, if you recall, that we updated every year because it was a requirement really of the MSBA to kind of project where your budget was gonna be in the new building. And to Al's point, the only thing that we're way off is our estimate of utilities. Um, our other estimates around operational costs are pretty close to what our projections were five years ago. Um, but that is not, we don't have a current one. Okay. Um, we do need to revisit it. Um, you know, once, <laughs> well, I think we're going to be dealing with the after effects of COVID for a while, but uh, in terms of the COVID slide, you know, and what our kids are going to need for additional teaching and learning opportunities to make up for what they've lost. But and I don't know what those are going to cost. Okay. Um, any other questions for Dr. Boquillen or for Michael Ruderman or Annie? Hi, Charlie, I just made a comment. I, th I thought that was Ed, I thought it was an excellent presentation, and I'm really delighted with the progress at the school. So thank you for your efforts. Thank you, John. Okay, Dr. McQuillan, thank you very much. Ed, uh, uh, Michael, uh, thank you for joining us. And um, we will uh, address the budget after, Annie, after uh, you can reconcile some of those numbers, okay? Got it. Thank you. Appreciate your coming. Good thank you. Thank My you. pleasure, everyone. I'll see Good you soon, you. Arif. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> okay, the next item uh, on the agenda is a discussion of the uh, uh, long-range planning process in Arlington. And um, you received some, uh, uh, an email with some information from George Koser, who um, sent me an email on, I think it was Sunday, on some work he had been doing, which I thought was really interesting and could provide some useful perspective for the uh, committee. So George, do you want to uh, take over the helm here and uh, make your presentation? Yes, thank you, Charlie. Let me share my screen. Uh, I'd like to go through 
the presentation. I won't be able to see you as I'm sharing. So please just unmute and ask questions about uh, what, uh, what's being presented while I go through that. We've scheduled about 20 minutes for the presentation, which I will try very hard to keep to. And then another 20 minutes or even a bit more, since I think we finished with Minuteman a little early, uh, for discussion, which is really the point of all of this. So let me just start, if I may. I hope everyone can see that. So this is a very informal presentation. Its sole purpose is, again, to facilitate discussion. There are no recommendations. I sound like a lawyer, for which I apologize, maybe, because engineers don't make good lawyers. Um, there's some options and impacts that are presented here, uh, but they're not recommended necessarily. Some options may not be feasible, some may be bad ideas. And as Charlie noted, I put this together on Sunday afternoon because I just didn't quite understand what the size and timing of this override and maybe others was. So I just wanted to understand a little bit better. We're gonna start with some spreadsheets for which I apologize, but I basically put numbers together to try to understand what was going on. And then there's some text afterwards, which really will just summarize the kinds of things that, that the spreadsheets are telling us. So this is very much about data and just trying to inform the spreadsheets cover a lot of years from 2005 through 2028. Um, I basically wanted to get this, a span of several overrides just to understand what happened in the past and why current times seem to be different. So we've had three in recent years. We've had some before that, but I don't think they're relevant. So we had one in 2005, 2011, and of course, 2019. For 6 million, 6.4, and 5.5 and million. We're, of course, looking at something noticeably larger than that for 2024 or so, and I just wanted to understand why. So we'll show three different cases for 2024. So the spreadsheets will show very summarized spending by school and town by year. Everything is rounded to the nearest million dollars. This is not precise financial stuff at all. A lot of things are lumped into other. So we'll show you the big budget items. The little ones are in other, everything does add up to the total budget and the total revenues each year. We do show the override stabilization fund appropriations, money in, uses, money out, and the fund balance each year, just so we can see how that relates. I got these numbers from the fiscal uh, five to 21 finance committee annual reports from the town website. One of them is missing, so I just kind of use the adjacent years to fill that one in. The 22 to 26 numbers are from the long range plan that our deputy town manager has presented and, and we have the latest update from a week ago. And since we're looking at an override possibly in 2024, I needed a couple more years beyond 26 to really understand what the size of that override might be since while it could just last two years, it seems overrides should be thought about usually uh, for a little bit longer. So I made very simple extrapolations from what the deputy town manager's long range plan was for those two out years. So again, speak up if there are questions, please, but we'll just kind of proceed. So this is, I'm gonna just pop up the pieces of the spreadsheet relatively quickly first, and then I've got lots of little animations that are going to kind of fly in and fly out where we can focus in on what some of the things are that, that might be um, explanations, issues for what is going on going forward. So we, uh, this is our total revenues, state aid. And by the way, state aid is not really quite increasing at two and a half percent per year. Again, this is very simplistic. Some of the state aid um, is various uh, bond and other kinds of things under the old um, school SBAB program and things like that. So I did not sweat the details local receipts, which also don't increase all that fast, property tax, where we'll see some jumps, the override stabilization fund, which we'll just track, and then everything else, heavily free cash. Expenses and appropriations, I distinguish between general and special education costs. Um, just a quick note that our special ed costs increased by 7% 
per year. Yeah, if you're an engineer, you know that a 7% increase annually means a doubling every 10 years. So our special ed costs went from 10 to about 20 in our first 10 years, and they're doubling again to about 40 in the next 10 years. So the notion that our special education costs have been increasing at about 7% a year is indeed true for this 20 plus year span. The general school budget has uh, basically tripled or will triple by the end of this period. The net town budget has less than doubled. Again, we know all these things. I've just put together a kind of long range continuing costs into one line, pensions, insurance, and capital. They're not all the same thing, but, but again, to keep it simple. Uh, appropriations um, to the override stabilization fund are in this line, and then everything else is lumped in other. That includes Minuteman. It actually includes a million dollars of school costs in a typical year that aren't attributed to either general or special warrant articles and all the other stuff. Last is uh, again, just looking at um, a little bit of interpretation of these things. So property tax increase year to year, the highlighted years are override years. Um, what the override amount was and what the percent increase was of the override and the override stabilization fund balance. So this is a base case with no override in 2024. So notice I just grabbed these numbers again from the deputy town managers long range plan, the first three and then just projected out the last two. So without an exclusion or sorry, an override, uh, we run, you know, these deficits, 7, 19, and 26 million in the three last years of the long range plan, and they would, of course, continue to increase. So that would mean fairly substantial cuts. But again, this is just a base case. So what do we want to emphasize? <clears throat> First, notice that our overrides have been about 6 million bucks. But notice that it was a 9% boost, then a 7%, and then a 5%. And our costs are very much a percentage gain. So our override percentages have been dropping. I'm neither criticizing nor praising. I'm just trying to understand and trying to give us a sense of what's going on. We will look at 2024 almost surely, both the absolute amount and the percentage is bigger. But, and then the other thing that we will look at really briefly is it's likely that we'll need something else in 2029 or maybe 2030. Some of what we choose to do, we as a town, in 2024 will affect what 2029 looks like. And it would be good to look a little bit at that. We'll have a little bit to say. The override stabilization fund balance, the green circled years of the years before we voted an override. So it was zero, it didn't exist in 05. It was zero in 2011, exhausted before we voted an override. It was $21 million uh, in 2019. So we've spent down or will have spent down all of that money in the next four years. Um, so that adds a little bit essentially to the effective uh, pool of override funds that existed in 2020 because we got to spend down an additional $21 million over four or five years. So that increases the effective side of, size of this override to some extent. We have a decision about if, if we ever wind up in a situation with a decent balance, exactly how to deal with that. Again, we can talk about that if people want. So that's the next thing to outline. Our structural rate of change in expenses is different in the first part of this period. And we had two overrides, took a lot of work to pass, but they lasted a long time. Our typical expense increase is in the 3% range <clears throat> over that span of time. So that let us have these override amounts and have a fairly long life to each. In the second half, um, our expense increase annually is running closer to 5% than 3%. Now there's some lower numbers here. We look at the very, yeah, but that's because we have these deep cuts sitting here. And I just basically compared the bottom line total, which you know, if we added the cuts back in would be growing fairly substantially. So we've, gone from something that's not that far above the two and a half percent prop two and a half levy limit. And yes, we understand that there are exclusions and growth and all that, but just using the two and a half as a milestone of sorts. 
we've gone from a growth rate that's not too much above, which means not a not huge override, not too often balances things, to a situation where in 2019, kicking in in 2020 and again in 2024, we're simply looking at a bigger structural deficit, one that looks kind of different than it did earlier on in recent history. Some minor things, but still to be pointed out as one looks at numbers. Um, I've got an orange underline under local receipts and net town budget. I'm gonna have a little bit of fun with statistical inference. So we've always heard and believed, and I do too, that our um, licenses, fees and whatever, you know, cover the costs appropriately of uh, administering them. Well, local receipts have gone from 8 million to roughly 10 million or 25% over time, while net town budget, which is a pretty good indicator of overall town costs, has gone from 25 to 37 or a 50% increase. So our local receipts have only increased at half the rate of kind of our cost index. It's possible that we're not raising our fees often enough or high enough. It's more subtle than that. A big chunk of local receipts is motor vehicle excise. That's only gone up by 25%, surprisingly, even though the town is gentrified and there's a lot of very fancy cars, but uh, they last longer. So it may be that NBE doesn't go up very fast over time. State aid isn't going up quite at the rate that our expenses are. All these are pointing us to a greater reliance on the thing that can go up, which is property tax. If we are able to increase local receipts and everything in this presentation is an if and a question mark and things to think about, if we can get a million bucks a year extra out of this, which may or may not be possible, that can cut down the size of future overrides if that's an issue. We have a very slow growth in three fiscal years of our property tax revenues. Um, in part, that's an artifact from a bunch of debt exclusions from the elementaries and I think the Gibbs um, reaching the end of their life. But, and you know, revenues, of course, property tax revenues go to exempt as well as non-exempt expenses. But nonetheless, we have a little bit of a, a lull here and, and that's kind of a one-time thing, but it doesn't help you know, very, really very much for things going forward in this next override. The, uh, and just going to the obvious, because I put this last, because I think we all know this, but the school budgets, general and special education, uh, are increasing from 34 million in 06 total to almost 110 million in 28. So that is a uh, tripling, while the town budget is going from 25 to 46, which is less than a doubling. So we clearly are being driven in our cost structure by an increased set of costs for the schools, which obviously we know, but we have to deal with. So I just wanted to point those sorts of things out. Um, let's go on to the next spreadsheet, which talks about a $25 million override in, 20, in uh, 2024 to cover currently projected expenses in the long range plan from again, the town manager's office with me tacking on a couple of out years. So we're looking at 25 million. The deputy town manager just sent out um, a PDF at like six o'clock tonight, which the chairman shared with me. Um, these numbers don't match uh, Sandy's numbers exactly, but they're not that far off. His assumptions will be a little different than mine. His math is much more precise than mine in, in his spreadsheet. So for discussion purposes and trying to understand what our issues are, um, I believe that this is close enough, but uh, there are some differences that I want to acknowledge. So by looking at, let me just back up one slide, but looking at this set of, of potential cuts or potential shortfalls, we basically need to boost our base revenues in the ballpark of 25 million bucks a year over the span of time to cover roughly a $25 million average gap. Uh, so we basically need that kind of boost. So hence the $25 million figure. It leaves us with a little bit of balance at the end. So I could have made it 24, but I just kept this simple. It's a relatively even numbers. 
So the property tax revenues jump by 29 million roughly, the typical $4 million per year increase from two and a half percent plus some growth, plus the 25 million override. So the first couple of years, we can sock away 11 and $7 million uh, by appropriating those monies because it's more than we will need the first two years um, for expenses. We appropriate those into the override stabilization fund. And then in the three out years, we use most of it. So that's all familiar terrain to everybody. Um, so that's our override fund balance. And something that happens here, if we have a 20 to $25 million override, the deputy town managers sheet only has a four year override as the longest time that it's covering. And I think it was 18 or 19 million. So he would be in the 20, 21, maybe 22 million range for a five year override. So not very different. But if we leave our cost structure the same from 2024 to 2028 without going, I'm already clobbering you with numbers, which for which I will pay a penance at some point and for which I apologize. But 2028 is going to look kind of the same. If the structural trends are the same, we're looking at a 20 something million dollar override in 2028. We may wish to think about what the 2028, 2029 really number might be that we in some sense are setting in motion if we make certain choices in 2024. So that's the point of the blue circle. Here's a $15 million override in 2024. Um, rather than 25. It's an 11% boost. It's not vastly different in boost than say the 9%, which was only a $6 million um, override in 2006. So the notion is, is there a way to get to a number that may be more acceptable for a whole variety of criteria that we can discuss? Um, so Property tax revenues um, only jumped by $19 million, 10 million less than in the other scenario because it's at 15 million plus an extra 4 million in our typical 2.5% growth. Um, so, how do we make such a thing balance? Because there's no magic here. Well, let me back up. Yeah, let me back up one because. So these are all, if we want to do this, what needs to happen? I'm not saying we do need to do this, or, and I sure don't know if we want to do this, but if, what are the kinds of things that we got to think about to make this possible? So one is, you know, it's only a million bucks a year, but a million bucks knocks a million bucks off the override. Can we do something with local receipts? I don't know the answer to that. We may wish to put some focus on it. By the way, we're in 2022, fiscal 2022. We have a couple of years to try to set some structural changes in motion uh, before a 2024 override to see if they're possible. That can affect our planning for the amount and possibly the timing of it. So it's a reason to talk about it now. So can we do a million or you know a million extra? I don't know, it's a possibility. Schools, um, but don't worry, the list doesn't, doesn't stop there. <laughs> you know, those, those are big drivers. If we're going to change, we have to change our cost structure by 10 million a year if our override is going to be 15 million versus 25. We got to find in the ballpark of $10 million to change our cost structure by. Uh, there really isn't any other magic about that. I'd originally kind of tried to do a 12 or 13 million override that just seemed fantasy. 15 may also be fantasy, but I'm using 15, maybe we make to 17 or 18. I don't know. So I only reduce our increase in special education spending by $1 million over this next five to seven years. It appears we have extraordinarily little flexibility. Flexibility we have to the extent we have any, and this is fantasy, is to perhaps see if the state is willing to do a special education cost circuit breaker or something, but we're not a poor town. So who knows if anything like that is possible, but I think the state is, is there. For general education, I don't need to tell you how gruesome these trade-offs are, but you know, that's where a lot of dollars are. 
The town budget doesn't go up by very much, but as we've already heard from Minuteman today and many other places, folks are working remotely, folks have restructured things. It would be extremely painful and controversial, but if we wanna change the cost structure of town, we could try to flatten, it's already quite low, but we could try to flatten the cost structure on the town side through whatever means of automation, remote working, things of that sort. I don't know how possible it is. I don't know if we want to do it, but we've got to find things there. If we can reduce these, if we can raise our revenues by a million, reduce school general costs, and this number of 67 million for general ed in 2028 was 71 million in the base case. So it's basically knocking off an increase of three quarters of a million per year over a set of years. Can we do that? I, do we want to do that? I don't know. Special ed on a very small increase. Uh, the net town budget, my hypothesis here is 4 million bucks, 46 down to 42. So we're finding ballpark four from the schools, four from the town, one from increased revenues, and one based on prayer and hope um, and errors in my spreadsheet. So here's the override fund balance just to make sure that it all looks. And here are the net expense changes required across, or net meaning, can we increase a bit of revenues other than through an override? And can we reduce our costs? And again, all a question. Again, what we do in 2024 will have an impact in 2028 because our cost structure will be different in the town and our gaps will be different. Well, let me just go through these text slides really quickly because I'm almost out of my 20 minutes. Uh, I'm really just gonna repeat almost just very quickly things that I've said as we've gone through the numbers. So percent increase of our overrides has increased over time. I use perhaps, I'm not being critical. This is a question, <laughs> I just don't know. Um, the override stabilization fund was large no big deal. It, made, it inflated the effect of that a little bit. And we added some services. In the past, we more or less said, gee whiz, here's all the stuff that's going to be cut if we, don't, if we don't pass this override. So this one was a little bit different. We may or may not be able to do that again. I don't know. Long-term expense, again, 3%-ish in the beginning part of this period, 5%-ish driven very much by school enrollment and special education costs but it's increased our gap over our two and a half percent prop two and a half limit. Again, with exclusions and growth and all that, I'm trying to be pretty simple about all this. We all know that it's more complex. Local receipts, I mentioned. One thing I didn't mention before, Ancient Tree has no benefits, but I, I am in possession of Ancient Tree, so I look for benefits wherever I can find them. So when I was on the committee in the 90s, the town manager at the time gave us budgets that didn't balance. And we were handed budgets that were one, usually one to three million. I think it was a terrible year, it was five. And our role was to run around and try to balance them. It's a process change. Conditions were very different in the 1990s than they are now, but it put some pressure on us to really find ways to find efficiencies and cuts and to think about what the priority of services was. Do we really need to provide these things? If so, how and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know. Again, something that's obvious, it helped us a lot in our first two overrides is we had a savior, you know, GIC, our, our insurance, sure made a huge difference in stretching out our override from two, 2011. No savior around right now that I can tell. We can hope for one, but I'm afraid we are stuck planning in the absence of one. That's too bad. It's another reason what makes it harder right now. School expenses, we've talked about net town expenses, property tax revenues, and again, some numbers. We, we just need to be realistic about them. And again, whatever the 2024 override is, there's, there's a structural carryover that will go to the next one. Very quick summary of option one, lots of cuts. If override doesn't pass, obviously we try it again for something smaller or different. Option two locks in our current cost structure, kind of. And option three, I've talked about the, the possible 
everything's got a question mark here, components of is there a way to change our structure. I will end there and hope that people are um, happy to discuss for a little while. And uh, thank you, everybody. I want to thank our chairman, uh, Charlie, for uh, spending a little bit of time with me the last two days. He uh, corrected a couple of errors that I had made. Um, so my acknowledgments and thanks to Charlie and uh, all errors are my responsibility. So thank you. Thank you, George. Very, uh, very interesting, very helpful. Uh, Annie, did you raise your hand? I did. Um, so I read the slides before John, uh, George made the presentation. So I thought a lot about this today and I have a couple of, of thoughts to share. One thing is that I wanna remind everybody that when we did a five and a half million dollar override in 2019, we did it specifically to raise some revenue so that we could increase school expenses. So some of the, the so the idea that somehow the schools have suddenly started to increase more is something that we knew about. We actually voted for it and so did the town. Um, so that percent increase is uh, partly about that. And it's also a lot about student growth. Um, and we knew when we did that five and a half million dollar override that it was not the same as the previous two overrides because it was much smaller and it was intended to be also to increase, to, to add some um, uh, expenses um, on the side. I don't think that the scenarios that George presented present the full range of possibilities um, we should be looking at a three-year override and see what that does if we're worried about making a huge jump all at once. And I think that it's really, really important when we discuss override versus budget cuts that we discuss it in terms of the services we are willing to forego. That it's, it's an easy discussion to have to just talk about the numbers. We look at the numbers and go, oh, well, we just need to get a couple million dollars out of the budget. Those couple million dollars are specific services that specific residents of Arlington are receiving. And I personally cannot have a discussion about what we should or should not do unless I know what the list of cuts is. Because I don't know what I'm willing to give up. And I'm not willing to just say, here, we'll give up a million dollars and you can give up whatever is on the list. And then I would also suggest that when we, if, if we are going to involve ourselves in the discussion about what the next override ought to be, we should consider that the people who really get to make that decision are the voters of Arlington. And we need to put options in front of the voters of Arlington. If we just wanna make a decision that we don't wanna raise our taxes, we could do that tomorrow. We could go to DPW and in this budget say, institute a trash fee and take all the collection and disposal of our trash off of the budget. And then we delay an override probably for another year and a half, okay? And we, we decrease its amplitude. And there's all kinds of logical reasons to do that. So there's a whole set of scenarios here that we should be discussing and a whole set of scenarios that we should put in front of the citizens of the town to make this decision. So I would love to see what a three-year override looks like in George's analysis, because I suspect that that is a $15 million override. And somewhere along the line, we have to admit that we are going to continue to do this. We are always going to be having overrides. There's a, there's a look back you could do where you could look at what would have happened if we had held an override in 2015 for $3 million. Where would we be today if we had done that? So I, I think if we had done that and we had done what we should have done, which is not change our cost structure that we developed after that, but to take that $3 million and put it in the stabilization fund, that we might be talking about a $7 million override in 2024. So there's a lot of different ways that you can play with this, but I think the last thing we should be talking about is cutting services for the citizens of Arlington. My two cents. Thank you, Annie. Um, Jonathan Wallach. Yes, thank you, Charlie. And thank you, George, for pulling these numbers together. Uh, you know, it really helps me to start wrapping my head around what, how this all works out and what this all means. And I, you know, have not thought about the implications clearly as much as Annie has. Um, so really my question is just in terms of um, one of your projections, which is I'm wondering uh, for your projections for general education um, beyond fiscal year 24, um, 
did you literally just take the um, the growth rate from whatever twenty two to twenty four and and apply that, or did you actually um, make an assumption about um, enrollment growth and apply the enrollment growth factor? So the base case and the $25 million override case, those numbers are pulled from the long range plan that was prepared by the town manager's office. And then I just projected out rather simply for fiscal 27 and 28. For the scenario with the $15 million override where there are cost structure changes, um, my, my numbers are purely examples and they basically just illustrated that, I just picked an example where we're taking roughly $4 million in cost structure changes from the schools and 4 million from the town. But that, that's a, it's just an example. There was no analysis on which of those should be done if either. Uh, it's simply showing the magnitude of what we're talking about if we want to affect the override amount by that, by that magnitude. And do, uh, do you know, or does anyone know in, in the long range plan for um, uh, 25 and 26, um, Charlie, do you know whether um, it includes an enrollment, continuation of the enrollment growth factor? Um, it does, I can't tell you what it is uh, because it's been um, you know, up in the air as a result of the drop in students with COVID. So. Uh, there is, there are some growth numbers in there. There's an ex expectation that uh, in next October, we will at least be back to the prior numbers, but nobody's sure about that. That's why we have the additional funds, uh, growth funds in the reserve fund. So it's, there's, there's a lot of things that aren't, aren't very clear right now. I guess I, my question is really, but there's an assumption that the per new pupil amount stays constant beyond uh, yeah I, I think i don't think I, i'll tell you um <clears throat> we have to see what the school department comes back with but the last demographic study that they did about um let me say three years ago i can't remember the exact date but somewhere around 25 2025 the school the, the projected enrollment growth goes to zero so there is a point at which that that line that normally includes the additional funds for growth is not shouldn't be there because the population is leveling off. I don't know if that demographic study is still applicable or not. Certainly, the the real question that's hanging over the town right now is: Will, will those 297 students that dropped from last October even come back? Okay, that's that's part of the part of the uh, uncertainty. Okay. Thank you, John Ellis. Um, is that document something that's like live and you make more updates to? It is not. Um, it's something I did last Sunday afternoon because I was confused. So the I did a lot of calculations by hand versus having lovely Excel formulas across cells. So for, I did it just as an exercise for me. I shared it with the chairman out of curiosity and perhaps bad judgment on my part. So. It's just a presentation for now. If we, since I'm on the IT subcommittee, which uh, Annie and Alan are wonderfully uh, chairing, we've been tasked by our chairman to try to come up with some analytics tools. Uh, I wasn't thinking of that in this respect at all, but if something like this is useful, we're not gonna have it for this year, I don't think, but it's one of the things that we as a group in the IT uh, could try to come up with for, for future use. John, let me make a comment, if I can just interrupt for one second. Um, in, in the SharePoint um, environment, in, uh, and somebody might be able to help me out of this, but I think it's in the manager's budget section, there is a spreadsheet, a live spreadsheet that has a slightly earlier version of the five-year plan as developed by Sandy Pooler. And it's quite complicated, but you actually can get in there and, you know, manipulate the inputs and the outputs. 
Yeah, Charlie, it's in a folder, FY22 long range planning. And I just put today's update into there also, but there is one spreadsheet from last week that, as you say, if you want to play what if games with growth factors and things like that, you can see how that impacts it. So yeah. it's in, it's up there in SharePoint. So, so you can get your hands on something that's live. And, and I spent some time um, today correlating uh, George's work with that. And it's, you know, as, as he said, uh, I mean, the, the, the deputy town manager is updating this as we, as we move along, but I think that George's work is basically to give everybody the idea of scope here. Uh, it's not to suggest that we uh, cut the school program or, or uh, you know, charge for garbage, the trash collection. It's just this, people, we, we need to understand where we are. And, and between uh, 2019 and 2024, we will have burned through $50 million of increased tax collections above the two and a half percent rate of increase. And, and if we continue to do that, then in another five years, it's going to be 60 million that we have to make up. And it's, if that's what the town wants to do, that's what the town wants to do. But I think, I think um, it, it's something that has to be uh, discussed and understood. We just can't blindly go along thinking that everything is, is hunky dory when it may not be. So um, George, the reason I asked that um, question was because there I liked your analysis about uh, receipts relative to town spending. Um, and I, I wondered if how much work it would be to do a similar number to show uh, how commercial property taxes um, had changed as a percentage of the overall budget over the past 20 years. I, I know as of fiscal 19, we were at about 5% commercial property. I know that's um, three times less than the townwide average that the town manager um, compares us to. Um, but I wondered how that number, just like your local receipts number, had stayed static or increased or decreased over time, because that would be a data point that would also be interesting to stakeholders in Arlington. John, I think I, if I remember right, I put something like that on the, it's on the SharePoint. Um, and I, I think the commercial tax rel has actually gone down relatively it used to be six percent it's now four percent or something like that i can i can get that for you it's on the dor website okay I mean, that would be good to add on george's sheet there and then just break down the property tax very small percentage of our tax base yeah and and the local receipts um i know it's a lot automobile but i also think it's a a big portion of that is um uh, property taxes on uh, telephone poles and things like that, which I suspect has been static. So um, I think if, if, before we identify local receipts as a, as a quote, problem, um, it would be interesting to see further insight into what that's broken down to and why that has, has declined relative to others and whether there, there are levers there that are even adjustable or not. Agreed. And there's, again, lots of components to local receipts. So I don't know if that's something that we would want to ask the town manager's office to look at or perhaps report to us on a periodic basis so that if indeed it looks like there are things that could be changed that we have a process that looks at them and tries to maintain them or increase them as, as best we can, if that's what we decide to do. John, anything else? No, I, I'm just doing the math in my head, though. But you know, George mentioned um, you know one million dollars a year from local receipts, but the numbers you just said, you know, going from four percent to six percent of commercial property increases, you know, two or three million dollars a year. So that's another uh, thing to be thinking about. Um, let me ask uh, Shane. You're you've got your hand up. I do. Thanks, Charlie. Um, so thanks, George. That was really helpful as, as a lawyer of the group and not an engineer. So this is really helpful for me. I know um, going through the budgets the last couple of meetings, I have been, it was always in the back of my mind. So it's helpful to see that other people are thinking about it and wrestling with it. Um, I just, to Annie's point, 
I, I agree that like we need to know what you know for for thinking about cutting budgets that's cutting services and and you know we're thinking about increasing revenues you know we, we need to be straight with the the, the taxpayers um, and just making sure like we have a clear understanding because if we're going to be explaining sort of the ramifications of a or b or all the above like we need to be really well informed and i guess maybe a question for this group is or for maybe more for my education is there something somewhere that i can just get a better understanding of a sort of how the levy is calculated so i just if there's something a dor or i know dor has a lot of information but maybe if somebody could send me in the chat or something just want to get a better understanding of like how it works today right when we get a number and we get something from dor how that's so how that math already works today so that might help me get a better foundation for tomorrow as we're thinking about what what a cut means or what uh override means so now, Sassi, you want to answer that question well i was going to suggest charlie that change just a minute Andy. Al, Al had his hand up I think. Al, you're on mute i think the uh w one way that that could give you a lot of information is the finance committee handbook uh and I think Charlie, you put it up on the uh, SharePoint today. Um, it's 2017, but it has fairly detailed information on the uh, uh, the tax rate. Has sample uh, recap sheets, which is really the bottom line when you look at the recap that sets the tax rate. Uh, but I would suggest um, I thought everybody had it. Um, if you don't, you could probably download it from our SharePoint. But the Finance Committee Handbook goes through that in a fair amount of detail um, on that. Thanks. That's yeah, in the a a ATFC folder, Shane. I saw it. Thank you. Thanks. Any any other comments, Shane? No, thanks very much. Okay. Um, Peter Howard. Uh, thank you, Charlie. Um, I'd like to suggest that uh, right now with COVID, it's not a good time to do this publicly. But there will come a good time, hopefully next year. And it would be good to be ready with something which is rather boiled down. And I think it has to be a little simpler than what George had. And, it, and as Annie said, it's got to have to provide service choices. Um, I, I just want to remind everybody that the uh, manager has uh, projected, I, uh, I believe it's a three to quarter percent increase in, in the town budget every year for, for the uh, next few years. And um, I, in the last couple of years, that's included adding personnel. The personnel have gone up uh, a, a couple of people every year. And, and of course, that's a big, cheap, big chunk of our, of our uh, budget. And um, mostly they've gone up to add new, you know, to add, to respond to the uh, demand for new services or the request for new services. That's, that's just a, I guess that's just a collection of thoughts. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Brian Beck, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Yes. Um, I think you can't look at any one item in, in to say this should be taken out, this should be saved. If you look at this in a broad picture, what you're really looking at is the town is growing out of control. And if it continues to grow this way, if we do a three-year override, three years from now, it's going to be exponentially larger. What, in my mind, what you need to do in addressing this is you have to look at all options. You need to, we need to increase the taxes through an override, but at the same time, we need to cut expenses somewhere. You, you just can't continue like this. And it, uh, it doesn't matter where, but the numbers are huge. You're not going to, we're not going to save this by making up a million dollars in local receipts. That's just a drop in the bucket. That is part of the answer, but it's not the only answer. It's not the only thing we need to look at. We need to look at every single, I don't want to say line in, but every single department as it goes through and address it. I mean, the pain, there's going to be pain somewhere and it needs to be felt across the board. Thank you, Brian. Andy, you had your hand up a minute ago. 
Yes. So I would like to suggest that part of the reason that we say to ourselves, oh, we just can't continue like this is because we live in a state with a property tax limitation. In states without property tax limitations, they just continue like this. In the state of Pennsylvania, my sister's house, which is larger than mine and worth much less, pays the same taxes. In the state of Wisconsin, in the town I grew up in, the house that I grew up in, which is slightly smaller than my house and worth much less, pays the same taxes that I pay. We are undertaxed. And that's because we have a property tax limitation. Now that property tax limitation does a good thing for us because it forces us to concentrate our minds on what are the services that we actually need. But two and a half percent is not enough. And we do not have the kind of land that Waltham has or Groton has so that we can't continually grow our tax base. And we don't have the kind of commercial tax base that Lexington does, so we can't split our rate. We live within those limitations. And that means that if we want to continue the services we have, we need to continually increase our taxes by more than the two and a half percent. So the discussion is about what services you wanna cut because whether you share the pain across the boards or you, or you do the thousand cuts or whatever, somewhere in there, there's a service cut. You cannot ask the fire department to continue to meet minimum manning and meet COLA raises for its staff without cutting services if you cut their budget. If you cut their budget, they're gonna cut people and we're gonna drop below minimum manning and we are not going to meet the national standard for responding to a fire. And sometime there might be a fire we don't get to in four minutes and somebody loses their house. Those are the kind of decisions that we're making. And that's why the discussion has to be about the service mix. What can we live without what do we want to keep? What do we not want to keep? I would suggest to you that we can't necessarily Thank you. cut. Yeah, yeah, I think we, we, said, we said that before. Thank you very much, Al. Okay, I um, I think this is a great discussion. And George, I think you did a great job uh, uh, to a certain degree. You know, uh, some of us on the uh, Long Range Planning Committee have been uh, not yelling, but trying to point out to people these types of issues. And this puts it forth really well. Um, and I think there's a lot of maybe action steps we could take. Action steps sounds very broad, but, but things like uh, local receipts and, and uh, uh, really looking a little bit more intently on the budget. But the big factor is gonna be next October 1st. What's gonna happen with school enrollment? Because um, the driver of all this has been school enrollment. And if that does not next October 1st, if that uh, doesn't grow 287 students, then that million dollars in the Finance Community Reserve Fund goes back into free cash and a million dollars gets taken out across the board. So that, that'll start, stop, start driving the size of the override down a bit. But um, whatever happens, we still need to think about what steps we wanna take and, and maybe one of them is to ask the manager uh, and, and the selectman and the clerk uh, to review um, local receipts and areas that they, uh, they could possibly adjust. Thank, thank you, Al. Uh, Dean, you had a comment? Yeah, so, so George, this is excellent work. I'm, I'm really happy that you did this. It's, um, it's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. And, and never had to, haven't had the time time to get to. Um, and and it's, it's very relevant. And, and the reason, I'm gonna highlight why I think it's relevant. So as you noted, school spending is the top driver of our, of our expense increases. And those, that school, the school spending is driven largely by enrollment. So all the demographic projections show that enrollment is going to level off around 25, well, on the school, 25, 26 school year. So when that happens, we should, we will end the growth factor. We will get to a more normalized growth rate. At the same time, it looks like special ed spending is no, is not hitting, it's, it's starting to abate, right? It's not, that 7% special ed is gonna be tough to keep up when you look at how it's been coming in. 
So that's going to slow down. So those things are good things that, that are happening in our favor. And if we really dug into the model, um, I think we would find that school spending is slow, going to slow, to, slow down um, on special ed and general ed. I think their impact on health insurance has been significant because when you add lots and lots of new teachers, that, that, that has an impact. But I can tell you, as we've been talking to the school department this year about their, their budget and the fact that their students are, are low, okay, they view the 22,000, now this is government speak, right? They have said that their budget has been cut in the current year. And their definition of cut was the budget last year was going to give them a million more dollars. Okay, Dean, just a and, second. Let, let, I know, but let me, let me explain, but this, this is why it's relevant. It, it's relevant because it starts to give the discussion of how spending works. And are we, just like Annie said, we're maintaining services, but the do dollar cost went down, which means, you know, and then, and, and so that's on the school side. And I think there's a lot of opportunity without cutting a second of services as our enrollment levels to level out that cost to a more normalized rate. If you do that, and it follows the other buckets, health insurance, pension, and whatnot, you do slow down the spending in the, in the budget considerably. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're sort of getting on in time here. So if there are no other new speakers or new comments, um, I'd like to sort of wrap this up. First of all, let me look and see if there are any new speakers or comments. No, okay. First of all, um, I, want to, I want to thank George John Dice, I, I have a question. I've been trying to, I don't know, maybe I did, didn't use the reactions thing correctly, but anyway, um, George, a question for you, if I may. Um, did, did I infer correctly that the, that the local receipts uh, had uh, de sort of decreased or weren't as increasing as much as they had been earlier? They, well, They've increased by 25% roughly over the 20 plus year span that I looked at. Um, so they're, they're increasing more slowly than other revenue sources, which puts more pressure on those. Um, and for the ones that we control, some of the license fees and other things, you know, if the fees were covering, if we're covering costs in 2005, for the town, but now town costs typically have gone up by 50% over that period, but the local receipts have only gone up by 25%. This suggests possibly that we haven't raised some fees uh, enough or licenses. I don't know that. This is a high level analysis, just kind of looking at what, what we might want to examine next. Well, we, we, we could, you know, ask the manager to look at that and see if that's the case, it would seem to me. Thank, thank you, John. Um, but I, I am, I do want to get on to some budgets if we can do that. Um, so as I started to say, George, thank you very much for, for this great work. Um, I, I just wanted to make a, a couple of comments. And then first of all, uh, Annie is dead on with respect to the, to the link here with services. But I also think that um, uh, the implication of what Dean just said is, is, is also critical. And, and that is, there is the issue of efficiency. And, and I personally am not convinced that the town is efficiently delivering the services, or if it, if it is gaining an efficiency, it's adding services that maybe we don't need, okay? And that's something that uh, I think is, a, is, is part of this whole um, framework. And the reason I wanted this to be brought before the committee um, is because it's, it is a looming problem. And, a couple of things that we have to keep in mind. First of all, uh, the Finance Committee, and I'm speaking from my own viewpoint here, but you, you, we all may have different opinions. We're, we're not a policy-making body. We're not elected by the public, okay? So, but we have to testify the town meeting what the quality of the financial condition of the town's budget is. Not the history, but the budget. And so, we need to understand the, the ins and outs of, of all of these issues. Um, I think that we have to educate or influence or inform our ideas and project them to both the Board of Selectmen and the school committee, as well as the management of the town and the school department. I don't exactly know how we do that, but we, we need to 
have some consensus among ourselves as to what these things imply, and then get that message out uh, to, to the policymakers in the town. And, and one of the, the, the last idea I'd like you to, I'd like to leave you with here is on this subject, and we, we need to address it again, I think, is what is the role of the Finance Committee? You know, our role is not to say that we need to change the student teacher ratio from X to Y. That's, that's not our role. But we do have to have, we have to be in a position to comment on the budgets and the re financial requests that are pre presented at the town meeting. So I just want to leave you with those thoughts and thank George again for a really excellent uh, presentation. So thank you, George. Um, the, uh, the next item, um, budget reviews. What time is it here? I think we, uh, it's 9.22, okay. Um, budgets, who's on tonight? I still think uh, Bill Keller, yes. Yeah, I can uh, go ahead with the assessor anytime you, uh, you're ready, Charlie. We're ready, go. Okay. All right, take a deep breath. We need to see the budget. Somebody has to put it up. Yeah, I got it right here. Hold on one second. Uh, how am I doing? Not so good. Okay, hold on. on page 50 for those using their hard copy. <laughs> How about now? There we go. Very good. Okay. Hey, okay. The second time is a charm. So um, we've been through a lot tonight, and I'm happy to say that I think we can get through the assessor budget in about a uh, nanosecond. Um, I don't want to uh, downplay the importance of this, but basically, um, if you take a look at it, the assessor budget for fiscal 2022 was a mirror of 2021 with some uh, minor exceptions in the area of salaries. So I'll just point that out briefly and then maybe we can move, move ahead and decide to uh, put this up for, uh, for, for a vote or for acceptance. So uh, with regard to salaries and wages, again, not a big change, but uh, everything you see there is based, basically uh, steps. Uh, the other item that sticks out a little bit is the longevity, 31%. But we have, uh, we have an aging um, staff on the assessors. And uh, that means you got to pay people more money. And um, with that, if we want to look at the expense side, the assessor, assessor, uh, the assessor expense side, there is really nothing there that jumps out. Um, I'll just say briefly that uh, the four of us on the subcommittee, myself, Al Tosti, Brian, and Arif, are in agreement that this budget looks pretty clean. And uh, I'd like to ask for a motion that we accept this budget of $345,085 as printed. So moved. Second. Uh, Annie LaCourte, uh, you have a question. No? Oh, sorry, my, my mistake. Um, are there any questions on the um, assessor's budget? I have a question. Yes, can, Christine. Can someone explain what otherwise unclassified is? Uh, yes. Those are other expenses that aren't classified under any other line on the uh, page. <laughs> any other questions? Such as, <laughs> what, what, what are we paying for there? I don't know, Alan, Al Tosti, or Charlie, can you want to hone in there? I, I, I don't know what's in that budget line. Uh, let me see. You know, I think we discussed every budget line in our meeting with the assessor, but I think uh, in all honesty, I'll take responsibility. I think we overlooked that one. 
But um, with your permission, I will go back to Paul uh, Tierney and uh, get an explanation. And maybe we can go forward and approve uh, or accept the budget as printed. Um, so uh, John Ellis, you had a question? Um, you may have answered this, but what, what would uh, uh, overtime be? Like why would somebody need overtime in the assessor's office? Or is this just something that appears but they never spend it or something? Yeah, so uh, that did come up. And overtime basically means that there are periods of time when his office gets deluged with excise tax and uh, abatement issues, requests. And these come up um, from time to time, pandemic or no pandemic. And so, uh, you know, that's just a contingency for, for the need to uh, spend more time in the office when they get uh, a, a bigger workload. Okay. I, I it, looks like, it looks like the actuals in 19 and 20 were zero. So they don't always use it. Yeah, that's what I was still wondering. They don't always use it. And um, to take a page from uh, our deputy town manager, he feels that, you know, there are many cases, I think the objective or the thinking is to put out a budget and, and it, they may have, they may take expenses against the budget of the department head may not, but it's there if they need it, rather than uh, try to whittle a number down and then put a budget uh, where, whereby they uh, feel they have to use it or lose it. So that's why you might see a budget amount, but not a history or year to date use and an expense number. If, if I could add to that, um, the two years that we're looking at were also COVID years. Um, so probably a third to a half in fiscal uh, 2019, the town hall was closed. So you don't have people coming across the counter <clears throat> asking a lot of questions about their assessment. And that's exactly when they closed is when people would get their assessments for 19. And then you have the same situation in fiscal 20. The town hall has been closed. Uh, and so there hasn't been as many people coming across to ask questions. There's not as much time, uh, perhaps need for overtime because they could actually spend it working rather than going to the counter. It's, I, I, th I think it's one explanation that you've seen in a lot of different places. Uh, the money just wasn't spent. Um, uh, out of state travel, in state travel is another uh, reason that money doesn't get spent. Thank you, Al. The other thing is, is that we're looking at a fiscal year which begins in June and then runs uh, July and then runs, runs through next June. And the pandemic will be either ending or all but over so that we have to think that uh, there'll be a different scenario expense-wise for this department, including things like in-state travel and, uh, and consulting and so forth. So um, any other questions? Uh, Bill, let me make a suggestion. Would you um, would you uh, hold off on your motion to resolve the twelve hundred dollar otherwise unclassified question? Yes, and and uh, just come back with that question and move. We'll move it immediately. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, next budget. I may I just uh, uh, ask one more question, please, Charlie? Go ahead, George. My my hand raising got blocked. I just looked at the uh, last year's budget book and 2018 actuals for the assessors over time were zero also, which was not a COVID year. If you're going back and asking, um, could I ask please that you uh, see if they really need that? Because we, we could reduce it if it's really almost never used. Okay, well, I think a good question to ask and one which I will ask is um, what is the expense if anything year to date? In other words, what if they spent in that category through December 31st of last year? And um, that may give us an indication as to how the budget for 2022 was formulated. Yes? Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I, I have one question, Bill. Um, can you tell us what the uh, balance and the um, revaluation uh, warrant article is? Uh, no, I can't. You know, we basically just um, spent our time, I think, looking at the uh, line items on the 
the budget itself, but I can go back and inquire about that Did as well. Is there any money in the, in the Warren article for the revaluation? I don't think there is one actually, so. Yeah, I don't know, but I can, I can. Uh, How about, yeah, I think it would be good to find out what the status of the revaluation activity is and how it's being paid for. Okay, so Charlie, Charlie, maybe you and I can do a quick uh, email exchange after the meeting. That'd be, that'd be fine, thank you. I know what I'm looking for. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have another budget? How about the planning budget? Oh, right ahead. Okay. Uh, the, the planning budget was tabled at our last meeting. There was yeah. concerns in the last. So can I make a motion to take it off the table? Is there a second? Second. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll avoid a roll call if there are no objections. Hearing none, go right ahead. Okay, I'm going to refer it to uh, Peter. Peter and I had a discussion, and uh, Peter also had email discussions with uh, Cindy Puller on the issues that were raised at the uh, last meeting. So, um, Peter, if you will, please. Yes. Uh, I, I talked to Sandy and asked him, as requested, uh, are you, am I coming through all right? I'm, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes. The, uh, he made, I asked him about all the general uh, budgets. Um, he, first of all, he said that the manager tries to manage the department has to the bottom line. They don't, he doesn't, they, he doesn't force them to think about uh, exactly what the expenses are except when, as they add up in the bottom line. Um, and I, I extract from that the idea that perhaps the, the, the uh, as has sometimes happened in the past, that the expenses, the uh, actual expenses are not uh, particularly active. Uh, he wanted to point out that if we uh, put pressure or, on the departments to make their uh, budgets, uh, Close to the uh, actuals and years, um, they will gradually they will gradually uh, find ways to spend the money so that those budgets are not uh, and that's not an efficient way to run a, a department as some of us know that have lived with that kind of a requirement. Um, I also should know that these general government budgets are, are small from a dollar's point of view in this, in the uh, scheme of the town budgets and town uh, monies for over looking at overrides all, taken all together they're less than half a million dollars um, and as somebody's already said um, this is probably not a very good year to, to do this kind of thing because because the pandemic makes everything uh, different in which we and we hope it will not be continued the same way. So uh, again, I think again uh, that it would not be good for us to spend a lot of time on this on, on this question. So, um, 
Peter, I think I'd, I'd like to jump in here for a second. Um, at the last meeting, the reason we tabled this uh, budget was because uh, Christine Deschler asked about a category of expenses. Perhaps somebody, I, we have some open mics here. If somebody can mute themselves, because I think you're picking up echoes. Um, so the question is, um, you know, are we going to find out what these expense items actually are supposed to be or not? And, and you know, I think um, the answer is that the, the, the town, the deputy town manager gave you is, um, is in my view, rather unsatisfactory. Um, this is a, this is a, a subject that I think while we're only dealing with the difference between a thousand dollars and two thousand dollars, it does have to do. It does come to the to the nature of what the finance committee is supposed to be doing. So um, I, I think the uh, the appropriate uh, step at this point is uh, is if you has a, did you move the budget already, David? So will somebody refresh my memory? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I, 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 I move, move, uh, we've taken our off table. Okay. That's what we've right. done. So then the appropriate step here, I, I think, um, is is for the budget to be moved. And uh, however the subcommittee wants to do it as a, as a value, uh, and then um, if somebody wants to change it, make a substitute motion, then the committee can make the decision. Is that reasonable? If that's, if whatever the will of the committee is, it's fine with me. Yeah. What the understanding is, what an understanding, if, if we're going to have this dilemma, you know, um, I, it's David, best, I think that I'm gonna separately, I, I, David, I'm going to separately address the dilemma. I understand it completely. It's, it's, this is a, uh, a Policy issue between the finance committee. Okay. And the finance committee. So, All right. Um, Charlie, I, I'd like Charlie, to make the motion that we approve the budget as printed. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, is there any further discussion? I, if I may, Charlie. Yes, Christine. Um, I. I am not expecting that the manager will have a budget presented to us that will be so minutely accurate um, that it would that it could bind anyone's hands. The, what I'm pointing out is not just the budget before us, but it appears to be a pattern throughout all of the budgets, or maybe not all of the budgets, most of the budgets, where the office supply category is significantly more than the actuals for 19 and 20. And if that money is not actually going to be spent on office supplies, I would like the manager to tell us that. I agree with you, Christine. Um, and Peter and, and David have, have pursued that question and uh, we didn't get an answer. Okay. So the question is, are we got an answer that was uh, what I would uh, gently call arm waving. So I don't think we can resolve that question tonight. There's only two things that we can do with respect to this budget, or three things we can do. We can table it again, we can vote it as recommended, or we can vote a substitute number. So the, it's been moved and seconded for, for as is. If anyone wants to make a, a recommendation, reducing that number, that's, that's to the committee. Okay, so in that case, I'm gonna call for a vote on the um, planning department budget as presented.
Grant Gibeon. No. Shane Blundell. Aye. John Ellis. Aye. Carolyn White is not here. Mary Margaret Franklemont. Uh, yeah. Uh, I can't, uh, speaking as a, as a secretary, I can't hear. Is that a no, yes, no? Uh, yes, yes. Arif Padaria. Yes. Jonathan Wallach. Aye. Brian Beck. Yes. Shannon Corp is not here. Daryl Harmer. Yes. John Deist. Yes. John? Yes. Alan Jones? Yes. Annie LaCourt? Yes. Bill Keller? Yes. George Closer? Yes. Christine Deschler? No. Dean Carmen? Yes. David McKenna? Yes. Did I miss anybody? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think I didn't get Tosti. Who did I miss? I didn't get Alan Tosti. Oh, you're right. I missed Alan. No. Yes. Yes. Okay. Could you? Yes. Two no's. What, what, did, did Grant give in? Was that a no? No. Uh, he was a no. And um, John Ellis a no? No. Uh, Christine Deschler was a no. John okay. Ellis was yes. Thank you. You're welcome. The budget is passed. Thank you, gentlemen. Is there another budget? Yes. I can do a controller and also a retirement. Let's start with the controller. Go right ahead. Thank you, Ari. Sure. All right. Let me pop it up there. Uh, give me one second, please. Uh, screen. All right. Okay. Can you see this one? Yes. Okay, great. So I'll tell you um, a few points here. So if you look at uh, lines 5224 and 5236, other supplies and other purchase services. Those have now been properly classified into the, into the buckets, telephone expenses and office supplies. Um, I think I've mentioned this before, but it's worth repeating that EDA has been working hard at getting uh, these items better classified. And so um, she's trying to promote that across all the departments. And there is some stuff that is still not correct, obviously. Uh, as well noted. Um, the other piece that I was uh, or a question about was uh, training. And as a conferences, the $15,000 is for conferences, various conferences and uh, munis training that was uh, put on hold for COVID. Um, and uh, keeping it there, she mentioned that uh, keeping it, she keeps it there and if it doesn't get used, it basically gets returned. <clears throat> so as you can see in the 2020, only about $1,800 $1, was used. Um, the other question um, I had asked, and that was from the 2020, was $27,525 for telephone expenses, which stuck out at me. It's an old issue, but I still wanted to get some resolution for it, and you guys all may call, but it has to do with upgrading the old telephone system to voice over IP. Okay. And uh, what else can I tell you? Um, so again, a lot of money basically <clears throat> not, not spent due to COVID. Some of the other issues that have been mentioned, just let me mention it out there, just uh, perhaps repetitive to what uh, was mentioned just earlier around overtime and so forth. So I won't belabor the point unless there are specific questions. So um, let me stop there and ask if there are any questions. Can you go through the salaries with us, please? Oh, yes. Um, what, 
Move it, move the page up. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah, of course. Yeah. That's what I'm looking at my book. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, you want me to make it bigger? Okay. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. All right. Oh, here we go. There's a step increase and uh, given to all department heads, and this was a discussion I think we've had before, and I uh, I left it alone. So, um, but that's. That's the increase allowed by the town manager. The $2,000 here, you can see my arrow perhaps. Is there anything specific around this, uh, around this that is of uh, concern? Did I see in the, on, the, on the top sheet that, that it was a reduction in salaries? Yeah, um, how come um, the number $360. Is, it, is that also reduced in the bottom sheet? It just it should be. Um, yeah, let's see here. So 203 and here is the, uh, let's just make sure, hold on. So that was uh, 203043, right? So 203, uh, which is here, and this is the zero four three. Okay. Are you seeing, are you seeing what I'm seeing on the budget yeah. book yeah. and the new? Yeah, we're thing. dealing with that funny column business again. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Any questions? Anyone? Oh yes. Go ahead, Alan Jones. <laughs> you caught my attention with that twenty-seven thousand five twenty-five for telephone expenses. The uh, the 2020 approved budget was only 27, the expense budget was only $27,000. Um, and it looks like the, the, the actual was way over the approved budget. I'm just wondering how that happened. Where, where'd that money come from? Uh, I can answer that. Okay. Or is that capital um, budget? No. Um, I, I believe that when the, when the actual budgets come back into this spreadsheet, they often time, times include expenditures that were appropriate in the prior year, but encumbered and show up in the in the 2020. And that's a likely cause of that. Well, okay. it wasn't in 2019 either. I, I, uh, there, there, there was never an ex there was never a bump in the expense budget, anything like that. So I'm just wondering how that got paid for. It had nothing to do with this year's budget, but it, it, it's a it's a curiosity. You know, I'm just wondering. I don't know. How was that, that paid for? So, uh, just make a footnote, then, Arif. If you could just go back and check on that, let the community know where that came from. Absolutely, will do. Any other questions on this budget? If I can ask one more, I'm looking at the uh, last year's budget book. And the telephone expenses for 2018 actual were thirty thousand four hundred and twenty dollars. So we spent thirty grand in 2018 and twenty eight grand in 2020. So if you're asking about that, it would be good just to understand the total cost and whether we're completely implemented. Thank you. Uh, absolutely, we'll do. Yes, I'll report that. Total cost for the VOIP system is what you're asking about, George. Correct? What those what that line 52, 15 means for 2018, 19, and 20. Got it. Uh, if I could, Go ahead. Mr. Chairman. Yes, David. I believe in that time period, th 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 there was a purchase of all brand new telephones and a new telephone system within, the, I know, within the town hall. Yes, but that was a capital expense that we allocated five hundred thousand dollars for about eight years ago, and okay. that was in the in the capital account. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, Charlie, I had my hand raised. Uh, go right ahead. I'm so, uh, you know, I, I lose that screen when the. Uh, uh, that that's okay. Um, I, I have the same question that you had, Charlie. Um, I don't. These numbers on the salary side don't seem to add up. I, I think. No, actually, we... they do. It's, I'll tell you what the problem is. Can you flip the salary up for a second? Yeah. We, we had this problem. That's good. 
we have this problem going through with the manager's budget. And, and the, the problem is that this column that says new pay, if I remember correctly, um, that includes um, that includes the it includes base step, but not longevity. Yes, base and step, okay. but not longevity. So it's just it's just a presentation issue, John. Right, but if you go back to the top page, longevity is separate, right? Yeah, it, it lumps it all together as a separate line. So the three three six zero four three is the total of new pay. Right. And then six through three seven is the total of longevity and six thousand total of overtime. It it's screwy and I'd like to change it, but that's the way it is. Uh, I've been maybe fighting I'm it for just 15 not years. understanding, but um, oh, so what's shown here is new pay on the second page includes longevity. No, 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 it doesn't. See, see three three six zero oh, four three. Scroll down to salaries. That's new pay. That's the although right. it is all. So, I, Again. What I'm saying is that, yeah. and I, I haven't done the math, but if you look at the individual line items between the budget I book, can explain it. They dropped a line from the 2020 budget. There was an additional line for um, a male stipend of $2,160. That would make it add up. Uh, thank you. That's missing in it from the from the detail, and it's in the detail in the 2021 budget but it's not in they just dropped the line and it doesn't add, it does not add up you're correct by twenty one hundred sixty dollars thank you any more questions on this budget i wondered about um software i think the would have John, what, say, software expenses. a little louder, please, John. I was wondering what the software expenses were. I don't see them here, and maybe they're in a different department's budget, but I would think the comptroller would be using some kinds of software, and I don't know where that would be, where that cost is. The software, you mean the Munis software? Is that her main program? That's the yeah, town's main program. Idea, yes. isn't it? That's an IT, yeah. Okay, so she does. There's no other program that the comptroller uses other than Munis. Nope. Well, Munis is a pretty comprehensive enterprise system. Oh. Yeah, Munis is an ERP. Yeah, exactly right. Correct. Probably office suites and things. Yeah, but the Munis is used by more than just the comptroller, so that's why it's right. in the IT budget. That does make sense. Thanks. Additional questions? You'll have to speak up because I can't see your hand raised. Okay, hearing none. Um, Arif, a motion is in order. Okay, I'd like to recommend the budget as presented. Can you slide the uh, screen up a little? For, uh, yes, sir. Uh, hang on. For three, let me make it a little smaller. For three, Three hundred forty-five thousand three hundred one. Second. So the budget's moved and seconded for three hundred forty-five thousand three hundred one. Uh, any further comments or questions? Therefore, go forward with a vote here. Uh, Grant Gibbon. Yes. Shane Blundell. Aye. John Ellis. Aye. Carolyn White's not here. Mary Margaret Franklemont. Yes. Yeah. Arif Padaria? Yes. Jonathan Wallet? Aye. Brian Beck? Yes. Peter Howard? Yes. Shailene Pokris is not here. Daryl Harmer? Yes. John Dice? Yes. Alan Jones? Yes. Annie LaCourt? Yes. William Keller? Yes. Al Tosti? Yes. George Koser. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. David McKenna. Yes. Thank you, David. So the uh, vote is unanimous for the comptroller's budget. Arif, do you have another budget? 
Yes, but I would like to, uh, the retirement budget is going to take more than four minutes uh, and it, it's 9.56. And so I think it's going to take at least five, 10, 20 minutes maybe. Okay. With a lot of discussion. So I would like to do it next time, please. All right. Um, it says it is 9.56. Uh, um, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn is in order. Second, second. Okay, we made it seconded. Any objections to adjourning? Yeah. Charlie, I had a few questions for homework that I could probably go through in a few minutes if you want to. Uh, uh, go right ahead. With those. Okay, the, one was on Article 13, which is June, uh, Juneteenth. I asked uh, Sandy if there would be any costs, and his answer was costs would be related to the changes in collective bargaining agreements. So, yes, there will be a cost down the road, but not this year. Um, if we celebrate Juneteenth in 2022, then that's probably in the budget we're discussion. So I think you need to follow up on that. Domestic partnerships, no additional costs. So it's probably not a FinCom article. Uh, article 23 about email addresses for town meeting members. He's gonna discuss that with IT. And the two additional salary lines and health and human services. He's gonna help me write a footnote to explain that. Okay. So Juneteenth, there might be a cost. So I think we should have a, a, discuss. a discussion on that. Good. Yep. Thank you very much. Any other things on the one minute? Motion has been made to adjourn and seconded. Hearing no objections, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you. Thank you.